Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the Oxlep Go Create and Escalate Grant Application uh, Overview webinar. Um, hopefully, everyone can see the slides and hear me. Um, if not, please drop a, a comment into the question bar or the chat bar, um, and we'll see if we can help. Um, first thing to say is that we are recording this session, um, and a link to it will go up online. I think we're probably going to put it on YouTube, but I'm sure somebody will correct me. Um, so please be aware that um, the whole session, any comments that you post are being recorded. I'm James Rule. I'm a consultant. I provide compliance management support to Oxlep for their European funded programs. Uh, so that covers both Go Create and Escalate. Um, and this is the overview session for the day. So there are going to be three presentations as we go through. The first one, uh, which should last about an hour, is the overview on both programs and the process, along with a session on um, why applications can be unsuccessful. We're then going to have a 15 minute break and then we will go into the session on Go Create Grants for 45 minutes. And then we'll go on to the session on Escalate Grants in 45, for 45 minutes. And then we've got a 15 minute slot at the end for any last queries. There are slots and slides in each of the presentations to allow for questions. If you have any, I believe you have a question bar that attendees can type questions into. Due to the vagaries of modern technology, that is the one thing that I as the presenter cannot see. Um, so we have a couple of colleagues from Oxlep who will be monitoring the questions and we'll make sure they're all captured and all answered. So for this particular webinar, if we could have the next slide, please, Catherine. We're going to cover the following things. We're going to find out whether or not you're eligible, cover the eligibility criteria. We'll run through um, how to apply for the grant, the specific rules, the common rules that cover both the Go Create and the Escalate grant schemes, the key dates for the process, because this is running um, faster than it used to run, although not as quickly as to be said as we've been running it for the last um, couple of months. As I've said, we'll then cover why applications are unsuccessful and critical email address for any questions that you have as you run through the process or that come up after the workshops. It's the business at oxfordshirelep.com email address. Please send any queries, inquiries, questions there. As I said, we're going to have separate sessions after this to cover the details on the individual ISFB and Escalate schemes. We've created guidance notes, notes sorry, for each of the schemes, and those are available on the Oxlep website. And there's one for the ISFB Go Create grants, and I believe we have one for Escalate uh, grants for enterprises for social good and grants for all other enterprises, access to finance and scale up. So the next thing I'm going to cover is uh, Oxlep, who we are and what we do. Just next slide, please. We are the local enterprise partnership for Oxfordshire. Um, so that means that we are a body that is responsible for supporting and developing um, businesses and skills within the Oxfordshire area. Uh, particular area under which both these programmes fall is Oxlet Business. So obviously the programmes have a focus on supporting businesses, SMEs, small, medium-sized enterprises. Uh, and we do that as part of the Growth Hub offer. Every local enterprise partnership has a Growth Hub, uh, which ranges from um, as simple as a, a telephone answering service uh, through to a full service Growth Hub that provides business support as Oxfordshire does. Um, my next slide is going to address the uh, potentially the elephant in the room. These programmes are both funded by the European Regional Development Fund, 
And as I'm sure everyone knows, the UK left the European Union um, at the end and ended the transition period as well at the end of December last year. Um, you may expect that that brings some changes to the way the programmes are managed and the way they operate. It doesn't. There are no changes as a result of the UK's departure from the EU. As part of the um, withdrawal agreement, the programmes remain part of the wider European structural in, and investment funds until they close down in, in a couple of years time. They therefore continue to be governed by the EU regulations and just as importantly, the UK managing authorities guidance is based on those regulations. So really, if anyone's seen these webinars before, that almost, um, there is no change. Now we can move on. Thank you. So in terms of eligibility, the grants uh, can only be awarded to small and medium sized enterprises to SMEs. So what qualifies as an SME? An SME is um, a company that has less than 250 employees and is not more than 25% owned by another business, another entity that is not itself an SME. Now, for most people, that's not an issue. But for some people who are perhaps 50% owned by a university or a venture capital firm, it can be an issue. Please talk to us. Please don't assume that you don't qualify as an SME if you have a parent company that owns more than 25% of the business, because there are a lot of exceptions. Um, the two I gave, venture capital and universities, don't count. They're exceptions. So even if you're 50, 70, 90% owned by a university or venture capital firm, you don't count. So you would still qualify as an SME. Does not make you ineligible. If in doubt, ask us. And that's a theme that I'll come back to repeatedly as we go through the presentation. In addition to the ownership of the number of employees, you need to have a turnover of less than 50 million euros and a balance sheet of less than 43 million euros, both of which are based on your last published accounts. So from the last financial year for which you've published accounts, have a look at the turnover and balance sheet. For most people, this is not an issue. The other area um, that we sometimes have problems with are what they call undertakings in difficulty. Um, now, this, has been relaxed as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic so that the test for whether or not you are an undertaking in difficulty is based on the position of the business as at December 2019. So the logic behind that is that if you are a business that has got into difficulty as a result of COVID, you are not disadvantaged by that basis. We can still support you. If you're a business that was in difficulty before COVID, we're not able to support you. So look at yourself as at December 2019 and establish whether or not you were a business in difficulty. Now, what that means is that it does not include a business, an SME that was less than three years old at December 2019. OK, so if you were less than three, we can support you, no question. And an undertaking in difficulty, an undertaking in difficulty is an SME that effectively is either subject to insolvency, which you'll know about, or in receipt of rescue or restructuring aid, which again you will know about, or effectively that has lost half of its subscribed share capital as a result of accumulated losses. So the table at the bottom of this slide gives some examples for how you work that out. If your original starting capital was £10,000, You've no cumulative losses. You're not a business in difficulty. If your original capital was £10,000, your cumulative losses against that capital of £4,999, we can still support you, you pass. If, however, your losses against the 10,000 of capital are £5,001, then you would fail the test. You're deemed an undertaking in difficulty. 
um, if you're a business that has for whatever reason no share capital for example a social enterprise that may not have um, a specific share capital allocation um, the two lines at the bottom set the situation out it's fairly clear if you have no share capital and any accumulated losses you'll fail the undertaking difficulty test so it is a simple calculation as i set out on the next slide thank you based again on the last full year of accounts um, or your position as at december 2019 it's a self-declaration and sign up form for both isfb and for the escalate program so when you've signed up to the program you'll have stated that you don't qualify you are not an undertaking in difficulty so you don't exclude yourselves um, we are formally obliged to check there's a regulation that says we have to carry out a check if you're applying for more than fifty thousand pounds of aid i don't think that will apply to uh, many if any people on the call otherwise we're required to carry out random spot checks on businesses and it is something that uh, our auditors do look at when they come out to inspect us if in doubt please speak to your accountant i've written out the formula to work out whether or not you pass or fail the test so the capital plus your cumulative profit and loss needs to be equal to or more than capital divided by two 50 percent of your starting capital again if in doubt ask us we're happy to have a look but it is a fairly straightforward calculation as soon as you know exactly what it is you're looking at next slide there are some key eligibility issues in terms of the costs that we can and cannot cover for both ISFB and for Escalate. We cannot cover staff costs. So by that, we cannot cover the costs relating to salaries of employees. Okay, that doesn't cover consultants. Consultancy costs are absolutely fine, um, but we cannot cover anyone who is on payroll, anyone who is staff. VAT costs on anything that you purchase can only be included either if you're not registered for VAT or if you are unable to recover VAT from HMRC as part of your normal VAT returns. Please seek advice on this. We are not VAT experts and we absolutely cannot give VAT advice to businesses if you're not sure whether or not the VAT that you incur on your grant project costs is recoverable from any source other than the grant you should check with your accountant it's not an easy area um, but your accountant will be able to tell you it is, of course, not helped by the fact that HMRC do periodically move the goalposts on this. The guidance on VAT and grant projects changed about three years ago. Um, so please ensure that you check this. We do require an audit trail for procurement. Um, because this is public money, ERDF uh, is public money it comes from the European Union, ultimately from um, European member states, including the UK. Um, it is governed by public procurement requirements. So what we've set out in the guidance is that for anything that costs less than 25,000, so 24,999 and below, we expect you to follow a three quotes process. Now that's fairly straightforward. You seek the written quotes and you provide those with your grant application. Um, you then tell us which of those three quotes you've chosen and for what reason and the procurement process is deemed to be completed. On the rare occasion that a grant applicant may be procuring something that is costing more than 24999, so over 25,000, there's a requirement under the ERDF regulations to run an open procurement. So what they mean by that is effectively that it is competitive 
and that any interested organization has the opportunity to respond. So the specific requirements are that there's a formal specification, a request for tender document, call it what you will, but it's a document that sets out exactly what it is that you want to buy. Preferably, well, I recommend that it sets out the maximum you're willing to pay for that service. And it will also set out things like the deadline for responses and how you're going to make the decision, how you plan to score the responses that you receive. Excuse me a moment. This needs to be advertised on um, an open website called Contracts Finder, which is a government website for um, public procurement opportunities. We can help putting adverts on Contracts Finder if necessary. It is fairly easy to register for and be set up on, um, but I know some organisations have struggled, um, in which case Oxlep have been able to put Contracts Finder notices out on their behalf. Um, we'd recommend that you also advertise on your own website and that meets the advertising requirements. Um, the adverts do need to be out, the, the call needs to be open for a minimum of two weeks. Um, and as with anything, the higher the value of the activity, the higher the value of the purchase, the longer you should be advertising. Um, we recommend that you don't advertise for much more than four weeks, simply because you start to drift into the time period for a full um, OGU process. Um, OGU being the process you'd have to follow if you were going to spend over 188, I think it is at the moment, thousand pounds. You then need to score the responses in exactly the same way as you set it out in the specification. Um, inform them, issue a contract or a purchase order, however you do it, and uh, provide evidence of all of this. We have developed a checklist um, that is particularly aimed at open procurement to support you through it. But what the guidance says in respect of open procurement is that if you think you're going to have to do one, please speak to the team before you submit your application it's critical that you get this right. Procurement is one of the areas where, certainly in the previous ERDF program, the vast majority of financial corrections were made. This is the thing that people tend to get wrong. And it's usually not deliberate. It's normally um, not, for example, keeping the submissions when they arrive. So you're not able to prove that it arrived before the deadline. So we've written you a checklist to help set that out. The other thing to say on this is that we do not expect anyone who thinks they need to do an open procurement to have completed it before we award the grant or before you apply. Um, the reason for that is that, as you can imagine, it takes several weeks to run through the process properly. It incurs time, effort and cost. Um, and therefore, we don't feel that it is appropriate to require people to do that before they know they're going to get the grant. If you have chosen to run a procurement um, before you've been awarded the grant, you're welcome to do so, but you will have to meet all of the procurement audit trail requirements. Issues where um, other issues, sorry, where there are problems with eligibility. You select suppliers who are already involved in your business. Um, it can be very easy to go to the people that you always go to and that you use, you know, every day, week in, week out. Um, that does raise concerns that it hasn't been transparent. Um, if you can demonstrate there are three quotes and the person that you use frequently has been chosen because they're the cheapest, absolutely fine. Or they provide the best service, absolutely fine. But just be aware that um, when you write, we've worked with them before and they know the business, that's um, of a slight red flag for an auditor. In terms of defrayal evidence, and as I, I think I mentioned later on, 
we reimburse grants based on defrayed costs so they have to have actually left um, the grant recipient's bank account before we can repay them um, using a credit card to pay for services and goods is absolutely fine we cannot reimburse the payment until that credit card has been paid and in order to reimburse it we need to see the credit card being paid to at least the value of the amount you're claiming from us so what i mean by that is that if you've paid for two thousand pounds worth of a service using a credit card in order for us to be able to prove that that has been defrayed from your bank account we would need to see a payment to that credit card that post dates the transaction on the credit card for at least two thousand pounds another issue that people sometimes come up against is if a business has an overseas bank account and is making a purchase in um, a, a different country and makes a payment from the overseas bank account using the local currency it's fine to do that the difficulty that we have around the audit trail is that um, if you make the payment from a uk bank account your bank statement will very helpfully set out the exchange rate that's been used so for an auditor there is no query over the amount that you're claiming in sterling and the amount that you've paid out in a different currency to meet the invoice where you're paying um, say a euros invoice in euros from a euro bank account where you already had some money your defrayal will be in euros and you need to be very clear what exchange rate you're using and why that exchange rate is suitable okay a brief word on the definitions of revenue and capital costs so any individual item thing um, piece of equipment that costs less than four thousand nine hundred ninety nine pounds excluding vat is categorized as a revenue cost okay now as you would probably imagine um, it is a little bit more complicated than that so for example if you were buying um, benching for a laboratory and the benching cost you £10,000 because it was five benches at £2,000 each. From an audit perspective, from a managing authority perspective, it would be a £10,000 capital cost, not five items at £2,000 because the benches connect together and go in the same lab. If, however, you're buying some very expensive computers, at six thousand pounds each and you buy three of them then that is three different entries into the asset register deemed to be three lots of six thousand or if you're buying normal laptops at a thousand pounds each and you buy ten of them i think it's hard to imagine anyone would apply for that but if you did it would be ten items at a thousand pounds each um, if in doubt speak to us an individual item that costs over a thousand pounds but less than the capital threshold of 4999 is classed as a mobile asset um, effectively it's it's what they deem to be a a low value asset they call it mobile because it would normally be things like a laptop or a printer something they deem can be moved these will also need to go onto the project asset register so there's a variety of details that we'll need from them um, and that will include things like the depreciation plan for them so how quickly will you depreciate them normally this is done um, over three years on a straight line basis and what that means is that in the future an auditor could check if they come out in two years time that you still have the asset and that you're still using it other people may have uh, depreciations that are one year six months um, i know of one organization that depreciates on the day of purchase because they can justify that effectively taking 
particular categories of assets out of the box um, eliminates their value. There's no resale value. We'll also need serial numbers from them and photographs of the asset in place, in situ, um, along with a photograph of said serial number. Um, it's a little bit painful, um, but we will help you through this if this is something that you need to do. Um, please, just a, a slight plea that I have to make, when we ask for a photograph of the asset in situ, please make sure we can see where the asset is rather than a photograph that shows absolutely nothing other than the asset um, so that the auditor has no way of knowing whether the asset is sitting in your business premises on your kitchen table in your neighbor's garage etc um, i've seen a lot of very nice photographs of very complicated bits of machinery and kit that show me perfectly what the machinery is but it could it could be anywhere Lastly, any item that costs over £5,000 excluding VAT is defined as being a capital item. This can only be included if capital spend is explicitly allowed within that particular grant scheme. So, on to the things that we can't fund. I've talked about salary costs. Um, we cannot fund travel and expenses costs. So um, the example I used to give was uh, trade fairs and expos. We could fund the tickets to enable you to access a trade fair. Unfortunately, we're not able to fund the costs to get you there. I've talked about VAT payments that you can recover from HMRC. We cannot fund any debt or refinancing costs. So if you buy anything on higher purchase, for example, it would not be eligible because those costs incur um, an interest figure. And we cannot fund anything to enable you to meet statutory or legislative requirements. So for example, um, if there's a requirement that says you must have a a qualified first aider within your business, we cannot provide funding to help you get somebody qualified. We can't include training. So my last example wasn't a particularly good one because it failed twice. Now this doesn't include things like leadership and management development, so it doesn't include things like mentoring. The shorthand for this is that ERDF money cannot be used to support anything that leads to a formal qualification at the end of it. So business development, business support um, is fine and it's um, what the, both projects provide outside of the grant scheme, um, but we cannot fund something that leads to qualification. Vehicle purchases or any higher purchase arrangements, we cannot fund vehicle purchases. Uh, there was an ERDF project in Oxfordshire that um, had an underspend and decided it would go out and buy a car several years ago. So it is something that auditors who come to Oxfordshire do look at and they do check. It's something that is quite high uh, on their agenda because it's happened before in this area. Other things that we can't fund, on the next slide please. Vehicle purchases, it's in there twice because as I say, it's something auditors really check for um, in Oxfordshire. We cannot fund anything that is a like for like or a routine replacement um, or something that's preventative or remedial maintenance. So if for example, you have a, a machine that allows you to make a hundred widgets an hour, of a certain specification, um, but it needs replacing because it's wearing out. Um, if you want to replace it with exactly the same machine that allows you to make the same number of widgets in the same time to the same quality, it's not something we can support because it's just a routine replacement. It's like for like. Similarly, if that machine is starting to break down or it needs a service, uh, we can't cover the costs for a preventative or remedial maintenance. You can't have 
somebody in to, to give it a service to fix a bit of it that's broken. If, however, you wanted to replace your machine for one that also allows you to make a different type of widget at the same time, absolutely fine. That's a different machine. It's not a like for like replacement. Similarly, if you wanted to upgrade your machine um, to enable it to do something different or to do something faster, that is not preventive, that is not remedial, it's not routine. So that would be an eligible cost. We cannot build or refurbish retail facilities. So that's the, the shop front side of retail. And there are some specific sectors that we can't support um, due to our state aid um, approach. And that includes the catchly named primary production of agricultural goods and fisheries aquaculture. So effectively, we can't support farms whose purpose is farming, growing food. Um, we can't support uh, fish farms. Um, we are currently seeking guidance on how people uh, check whether they fall into the primary production categories. Um, and this is, I suppose, one area where the departure from the European Union has had a slight effect because the websites to which we used to direct anyone who wasn't sure uh, has been taken down. So we're seeking um, an explanation for where we should direct people to find the answer. Um, we cannot support road freight businesses or services of general economic interest. Um, so we couldn't support um, Oxlep ourselves, sort of um, economic development organization. Um, we couldn't directly support a school, for example. We can't support export related activities. Now that doesn't mean that you can't export your products and services abroad. What it means is that we can't help you specifically to set up the um, processes, mechanisms and arrangements that enable that export. Nor can we support activities that favour domestic over exported goods. So we couldn't support a project um, that would simply use um, Oxfordshire based um, suppliers and inputs uh, simply because they were Oxfordshire based. So we're not allowed to discriminate uh, in that particular way. As well as all that, there are certain deliverables that we have to report. Um, the fairly simple ones being the amount of grant that we've paid out and the amount of match funding that has been provided against that grant. It's fairly straightforward. We will know that anyway as part of your grant claims. Um, it's, it's uncontroversial. We don't have to ask you for anything different. We also need to report on the employment increase. So that's any new jobs that have been created as a result of the grant project. Um, and you need to confirm to us that those jobs have been created as a result of the grant project and provide some detail on them, number of hours a week um, and uh, some equalities data on the individual who's filled it. You can include um, part time jobs. We can report um, an 0.5 FTE employment increase just as easily as we can report a full time job. We also have to report new products that are introduced to the firm or to the market. That's two different deliverables. So even if you haven't launched your product for sale, if it's now available within the firm, there is a deliverable we can capture there. Again, it's self certifications, although for launching a product into the market, an auditor would expect to see copies of some kind of marketing collateral to prove that it's launched. We also support new businesses. So that's businesses, or sorry, we report new businesses that we have supported. So that is businesses that are less than 12 months old. Again, we know who you are because you've provided us uh, with that detail in your sign up form. So there's no additional information that we need from you for that. 
with all of this as i've mentioned as we've gone through evidence is needed and as i'm sure you won't be surprised to hear a compliance person say there's a form for that so how do you apply the first thing to do other of course than uh, watching the webinars that we're putting on is to read the guidance on the website you should speak to the team uh, both the core OXLEP team and the advisors for each of the program. You should complete the application form that we send you and please use the checklists, both the checklist for submission, which is um, an extremely useful, I know it is because I wrote it, uh, list of documents that you can check you've provided us with, um, and also the procurement checklist, and that will help you to understand exactly what it is you need to provide both for the three written quotes process and if you need to do it for an open procurement process and then wait and see the timetable for the programs is set out within the guidance notes and on the next slide thank you and um, as you can see we're having cut off dates uh, for both programs now at midday on the third friday of each month so we will review the applications that we receive by midday on the 19th of february in order to notify applicants of the outcome by the 12th of march so if you haven't heard from us on the 11th of march please don't worry if you haven't heard from us on the 13th of March, that's the time to chase. If there is going to be a delay, the expectation is that we will let you know that there's been a delay to the timetable. It shouldn't be necessary for a grant applicant to chase Oxlep to find out what's happening. And as you can see, they just run through the third Friday um, of each month. Um, and then we notify you i think it's around about three and a half weeks later please note that we are not able to offer the soft check proofreading style service that we've done in previous rounds uh, we haven't been able to offer this um, since the middle of 2020 um, if that changes if that service does come back and we're able to offer a soft check proofreading service again we will publish that in the guidance we'll put that on our website so that everyone knows so what are the rules i've talked a little bit about defrayed expenditure you must have spent the money from your bank account so it's critical that you're in a position to cash flow these projects um, and the defrayed expenditure must be incurred so you must spend it after the date of the grant offer letter the grant offer letter obviously has an issue date it will also have um, an expenditure date within it usually those two are the same but it is possible for us to predate the expenditure incurred date it can never predate the grant panel that makes the decision and you should be very careful if you have done for example a three quotes process and selected your supplier that the invoice the formal invoice against which you're going to pay does not predate the earliest date at which um, expenditure can be incurred the reason for that is that an auditor could look at that situation and say this grant applicant was willing to spend the money without the grant okay so before the grant was awarded before they knew they had the grant they were willing to commit to spending this money therefore they didn't need the grant in order to spend the money therefore there is no added value of public funding that's a worst case scenario but it's critical then that your commitments and that your defrayal take place after We've told you that you can receive a grant after we've awarded you the grant and after the date set out in the offer letter. 
I've talked a fair bit about procurement rules. Three quotes are required. Um, I very reluctantly now and through gritted teeth admit that there are situations in which three quotes are not required. Um, so, for example, if you plan to do Facebook advertising, your quote will be from Facebook. There isn't really anywhere else you can go unless it's wrapped into um, a bigger piece of marketing work. The evidence and the audit trail is key. It's critical for um, these programs. We are very um, strongly, I'm not sure if that's quite the right word, audited. Um, and it has been on an annual basis for ISFB um, and about an 18 month basis for Escalate. And the auditors will look at our grant projects and they will look at the procurements that the grant recipients have undertaken. So it's critical that we have the correct evidence, the copies of invoices, copies of procurement activity evidence and evidence of defrayal. So um, when delivering this in a in a face to face setting, I tend to pose the question as to whether the audience thinks we're flexible or rigid, um, which normally elicits some nervous laughter from the room. Um, I think we're as flexible as we can be within a fairly rigid uh, framework. So I seem to be keeping reasonably to time. So we're on to the second part of the presentation, um, which is why applications tend to be unsuccessful. Um, there is a reason that I do it this way round, um, not least because it's um, easier to learn from um, mistakes than it is to follow a list of, of instructions. And the second reason is that this is a competitive process. Even if you follow all of the advice that you're given, it is possible that you will still be unsuccessful. And that's because it's competitive. We have limited pots of money for both programs. Um, and it may be that your application, your grant project isn't a strong fit with the program or that there are simply applications that are a stronger fit that the grant panel wishes to support. So I try to do a list of mistakes to avoid rather than anything that suggests that if you follow an ABC of instructions, you're guaranteed to get a grant because it is competitive. So the first thing is length. So think Goldilocks. Your grant application should neither be too long nor too short. It should be just right. So what I mean by that is that we do give um, word limits within the application form. So we tell you the maximum length that we are expecting to see. Um, if your grant application requires you to write um, half that number of words and it's complete and it's clear because your project and business are straightforward, stop there. Okay, the word limit is not a target. At the same time, if you've written one paragraph that barely covers half a page of the application form, you have almost certainly not provided us with enough information. And you haven't provided us with enough information to make an informed choice. It is very difficult for assessors and scorers and panel members to give high marks and to recommend funding for something that they don't understand, where they haven't got enough information to know what the project is, to know what impact it might have on the business. Similarly, in terms of drafting, um, please don't be obtuse. Uh, what does that mean? I normally get a laugh uh, when there's a room full of people. It means don't use long and complicated words like obtuse. Um, keep it clear and keep it simple. You will always be more of an expert in your business than the people who are assessing and scoring uh, these applications. Um, so please spell things out. You do have enough space to keep it clear, keep it simple. The critical thing 
is that assessors can understand it and are not confused. An assessor who is confused, and I speak from experience, finds it very difficult to give high scores because we're not sure what we're scoring. It's very difficult. Style. Um, spell checker is there for a reason. Um, we will never ever fail or not fund an application on the basis of spelling mistakes or poor grammar or something that is poorly written. If it's so poorly written that we can't understand it, that is an issue and that will almost certainly affect the scores given, but we won't fail an application for the fact that there are typo spelling mistakes in it. However, assessors and scorers are only human. I know they are, I'm one myself. If you read an application that is full of spelling mistakes, um, and the classic one is to um, get ERDF, get the acronym the wrong way around, EDRF, um, or you get your own company name wrong, I have seen that, yes. Um, it influences the attitude of the assessor, it makes it more likely that the assessor will give a lower score because it queries the accuracy and the attention to detail. It's a simple or reasonably simple fix when using something like Word because it will spell check, it will give you advice on editor settings. The quality of the application. Now, what I mean by this is take your time with it. Um, we have monthly deadlines, okay? So if you are late for one, there'll be another one in a month's time. If we think we're going to run out of money, we will let everyone know it will be published on the website. Um, if you are writing your application, starting to write your application two weeks out from the deadline, you should be fine. If you're starting to write your application at uh, midday on the Thursday, the 12th, uh, sorry, I can't remember the date now, the Thursday before the deadline in February, um, you've almost certainly not left yourself enough time to do it. Use our checking service such as it is, and where possible, I'd recommend a conversation with um, Peter for ISFB, our advisor, and Andrea for Escalate, our advisor on Escalate, um, for advice on the business and whether a grant is the best thing for you and please please be consistent within your application um, if you say that um, you're looking for a grant of eight thousand five hundred pounds and fifty pence on page one please make sure that on pages two four seven and ten you are also seeking a grant for £8,500.50. Um, it's very difficult for us to know which figure is correct if the figures are different all the way through, or if your preferred supplier is different all the way through, um, or if you describe things in different ways throughout the application. Uh, the critical thing for this is that it's clear and that it's consistent. So if possible, my advice is to get somebody to proofread it for you. If you start writing your application early enough, you should be able to find somebody from within your business or potentially outside who's not familiar with the application that you've written, who can proofread it and sense check it for you. And hopefully if they can understand it, it makes sense and they feel it's consistent, it will make sense to an assessor and scorer who doesn't know your business as well as you do. And the last thing is please fill everything in on the form. Um, I may be compliance, um, but I'm not a great fan of creating boxes and spaces on forms if we don't need them. If a box is left blank when you filled your form in, could you put not applicable in it and the form still makes sense? So, for example, um, when you're summarising the grant requested in the box that says grant rate, 
and you've left that blank, could you put not applicable in there and the form still makes sense? No, because there will always be a grant rate that you're seeking. Um, there will be some boxes where you could put not applicable and it makes sense. You may not have a website, whatever it may be. Um, you know, you may not have any other sources of funding that you've explored, in which case not applicable is, is acceptable. Um, please ensure that the form still makes sense if a box is going to be left blank. In terms of what you put into your application, thank you, Catherine. Um, please don't assume prior knowledge. As I've said before, you will know your business um, and your project intimately, far better than we do, far better than we can. Um, if you assume that there is a degree of prior knowledge about your business, about your sector, about your market, um, I can be fairly certain that at least one of the assessors, at least one of the scorers won't have that prior knowledge. If you find yourself thinking, well, it goes without saying that, it never does. Put it in, set it out. As, as I'm sure assessors will know, as I'm sure you will know, you know, the market is this, the market has done that, whatever it may be. Um, think about the structure. Um, start the beginning, go on to the middle and finish at the end. Um, this always sounds a slightly odd thing to say, but people are usually, and quite rightly, very enthusiastic about their company and their grant project. And they want to jump right into explaining um, what the project will do, how you're going to do it. Um, and sometimes they forget to set the context. They forget to start at the beginning and say, this is my business, this is my market, this is where we are at the moment, and this is what we need, therefore this is what we're going to do. And then, and therefore this is the impact it will have on us. So it does need to be a logical progression through because the content needs to be relevant. Um, I have seen applications that give um, not to be fair on the side of Oxlep, but um, other programs, pages and pages of what are probably fascinating calculations and circuit diagrams uh, and efficiency claims, none of which really mean anything due to the fact that the assessors lacked the PhD required to understand them. What you're doing is telling us a story. I'm not wildly keen on that phrase but you're telling us um, providing us with a narrative that needs to fill the gap of what do we the assessors need to know in order to score you well in order to score you highly um, so you've got to decide whether the content that you're putting in is necessary or relevant or if it's um, a nice to have that would be interested in somebody who happens to be particularly fascinated by your business area. You are welcome to use attachments and to provide additional documents. Um, I always say, please do this sparingly. Um, it is, for example, quite likely that an assessor will be able to read one or two pages of additional documents. It is very unlikely that they'll be able to read 50 or 100 pages of additional documents. Um, if you must provide largish numbers of additional documents, please can you reference um, the pages that people need to look at? Sorry, I don't know if anyone can hear that. That's my doorbell, I will ignore it. Um, but do not, and you should not, assume that because it's buried on page 732 of the additional attachments, it's something that we've looked at. Next slide, please. So in terms of the process, first thing to say is um, RTQ, another three letter acronym, read the question. Um, both the application form and the guidance set out quite clearly everything that we need to know in terms of the questions that we're asking. Um, 
please take some time to think about what it is that we're asking for uh, before you jump into answering it, which leads me quite neatly into the second of my two three-letter acronyms, ATQ, answer the question. Um, for us as assessors and scorers to provide a high score, we need an answer to the question that we've asked. So if you've asked about the impact of um, your grant project on your business, please provide us with enough detail on that impact so that we can answer and score the question. Within the process, three quotes does mean three quotes. Um, I've done my gritted teeth element about things like uh, Facebook advertising, but if it really is impossible, then in an ideal world, you would have a confirmation from another supplier saying, we're terribly sorry, we can't quote for this. Even better would be an email that said, we can't quote for this. We think the only company that can do it is XYZ and XYZ is the only company you've got to quote from. Um, that is my dream position as a compliance person. Uh, sadly, I've never seen it, um, but you should um, have a fairly strong justification for why no more than one or two quotes is possible. Um, if you find yourself saying, but I'm different, um, think very hard about whether your situation is different. Um, I've been doing this for more years than I remember, um, and I haven't come across that many examples and instances where there is a true difference. Um, and certainly if you find yourself saying, well, we've worked with them before, that's exactly the whole point about quotes and a competitive process. Um, we're looking for best value for the public funding rather than just giving it to the people who you or to whom you always give it. So in terms of what happens when you have a grant, first bullet is one of those things that um, I would say it goes without saying, but I'm therefore going to say it anyway, please wait until you have a grant awarded before spending the money. The next one's even better, please actually spend it. Um, in all the years I've been doing this, I am still surprised by the number of um, businesses who will submit grant applications, be awarded a grant for activity that can, you know, they're desperate to have started the day before the grant was awarded and who then just don't actually spend the money. Um, I can understand that things change. If that changes, please tell us. The one that I can never really understand are the businesses who then don't claim it. So you've spent the money, you've delivered your project, you've done everything you said you would. Um, please claim the grant back from us. We can't reimburse you until you provide a grant claim with the evidence. Um, and as I said, if there are any delays or if anything does change, let us know. This is a situation in which it is far, far, far better to ask us for permission rather than to try and ask us for forgiveness. So what that means is if you're going to change something, please check it with the team first, check it some a change that we can still fund and still support, um, rather than something that we may have to turn down for whatever reason. And please make sure you provide the necessary evidence with your claim. This is set out in the guidance notes. I've talked um, at some length about this in the presentation and um, it will be described in the grant offer letter that we provide you with. Okay, so in terms of more information, you're welcome to watch this webinar again. Uh, in fact, as many times as you wish, uh, since we're gonna make it available online. Please watch the specific program presentations and we'll be moving on to those shortly. The slides and the guidance notes are on the Oxlap website, along with a pack of frequently asked questions. So this is questions and answers where people have asked Oxlap for clarification or explanation. Um, we update that um, as often as it needs to be. Actually, at one stage I was updating it twice a week, 
Um, other times I've been updating about once a month. Um, they are published on the website and we do make those Q and A's generic. So if you ask us something that is uh, specific to your business or to your grant project, um, we will, before we publish it, make the question generic. And you should email those questions to the business at oxfordshirelep.com email address. So I'm aware that I'm pretty much on my hour's time. Um, I haven't seen any questions pop up in the chat line. Um, Hi James, just Hi. one question please. Mm -hmm. So um, I've just got a question asking um, what if there is a specific specialist skill or knowledge being developed between the parties to secure a partner on a single quote basis? Uh, so presumably the context of that question is that you work with a certain organisation and you're developing the new product effectively in conjunction with them. Um, and it's that effectively a partner, if you like, um, that would be doing the, the development work. Um, it is not ideal, he says, um, because it doesn't really allow for a competitive process. However, under the three quotes um, process, I think that would be okay because you'd have a quote from somebody that said uh, yes I can do this I've been working with you before this is how much it will cost and then you will either have other organizations that say well we can't do this because we don't know the business or yes we could do this sort of activity but it would cost us twice as much because we'd have to understand the business as well so that would be acceptable um, under a, an open process, if it's more than the 24,999, um, it would have to be advertised. Um, so it would be one of those instances where you would have to run the process, but my suspicion would be that you would only receive a single response that was within budget, because there'd only be one company that would meet your requirements. Um, it's one of those questions that may vary depending on the exact context of the business and the relationship between the two partners. Um, one thing that we don't have within either ISFB or Escalate are partnership grants where there's more than one grant recipient. But I'm happy to have a more detailed discussion on that, uh, probably outside of a, a shared webinar. Thank you, James. There's a follow up question to that, but I think we can pick that up outside of um, the webinar with the client. OK, perfect. In which case, if there are no other questions, I think we're due to go to the Go Create webinar. OK, welcome back. It is quarter past, so we are moving on to the first of the um, two program specific parts of the webinar and to introduce that there's Sophie from the ISFB team. Hi everybody so I'm um, Sophie Lee the ISFB program executive um, so I'm just going to facilitate this half hour session specifically going through ISFB uh, Go Create um, I'd also, also like to welcome Peter Russell, um, who's joining as part of the panel for questions um, after James goes through the slides. So Peter is our innovation advisor on the on the innovation programme. So I'll hand back over to James um, just to talk through the ISB, ISFB specific slides and then we can open for some questions. Thanks, James. Thank you, Sophie. Um, so just to reiterate again that uh, this is still being recorded. Um, according to little notice on my toolbar here uh, and that we will have a 
dedicated slot for questions at the end of the process, the slides. What I'm covering in this one is to provide an overview of the ISFB program, of which the GoCreate grants are one element, setting out what grant support is available, the eligible activities, and how the GoCreate grant um, funding packages work. And again, there's the business at OxfordshireLEP.com email address for questions. So innovation support for business um, has three elements, one of which is the provision of innovation facilities, an eco business center, agile, um, and another lab space whose name completely escapes me and I've missed off the slide, um, which I shall probably get into trouble for later. Um, and there was a plan for a co-working space, which unfortunately hasn't been able to be created. Um, we have uh, innovation support products, so that's webinars, um, workshops, as was when people could meet up face to face, and one-to-one -one support um, from Peter. And we also have the Go Create grant element. Um, at the moment, the project only involves two partners, so it's uh, contractually with the county council, with Oxlep as the lead delivery partner, and the other delivery partners, uh, the university. Uh, City Council, Sherwell District Council and the University Hospital Trust, their activity came to an end uh, late last year. So the key question that everyone always asks is how much is available? The original budget for the GoCreate grant, so the amount of revenue money we had to spend was 875,000. We have committed so that's not paid out, but that's committed to offer letters about 638,000 just under, meaning that we have about 237,000 of uncommitted funds available. Clearly, this number um, changes each time we want run a grant panel, grant round, and each time we award a grant project. Um, but it also can go up when grant projects come to an end and have underspent or as occasionally happens have to withdraw for whatever reason. The maximum grant that we expect to give out is £50,000 and our grant rate um, is 25% at most. So that's the revenue side of the pot. On the capital side, we have a budget of just under £128,000, um, of which so far we have not uh, funded any capital grants. So that budget is still available. Um, the maximum capital element per grant is £20,000 or up to 50% of the total costs, whichever is the smaller. And as for the revenue, it's a 25% maximum grant rate. So key things to be aware of, um, we will not fund any grants that are 100% capital. So they've got to be 50% capital, 50% revenue in terms of total cost. And our expectation for the capital expenditure is that you'll be able to claim it within 12 weeks of the grant offer letter. The working assumption there being that capital spend um, is easier and quicker to incur so that within three months of the grant project you can go out and buy the items that you're expecting to buy. If for any reason you think that is unrealistic and that could be because um, it takes longer to manufacture your machine or your equipment or whatever it is you're buying, um, please let us know. Okay, next slide please, thank you. So the eligible activities for a GoCreate grant, as I've said, they can be capital or revenue costs, um, either a blend of both or 100% revenue, either is acceptable. They're to fund activities uh, that are all around innovation. So it's investment in product and service development. And we take a broad approach to innovation, as I'll come on to in a later slide. It can cover technological and applied research. It can be developing pilot lines. It can be things to validate um, your product. 
it can even stretch into first production, prototype production activity. So there is a broad range of activities, um, all supporting innovation within businesses, both product and service. Next slide. So, as I mentioned in the um, generic slide presentation, you have to be an SME. And for Go Create, you have to be involved in innovation, product, process, or service. Um, what this um, slide is supposed to be conveying is that we take a very broad um, view of what constitutes innovation. Um, if you're doing something new, if you're doing something different, then you are probably going to fit within the scope of um, an innovation project. As ever, if in doubt, please ask us. There are the same ineligible sectors, that's due to using the de minimis state aid exemption. Um, but since I think virtually everyone on this call was in the, uh, the previous webinar, the generic one, I'm not gonna run through them in any detail. For anyone who is watching this uh, later and has not yet watched the, um, the generic presentation, uh, some more detail on those sectors is in there. And the next slide. Thank you. So how does it work? In terms of Go Create Grants, um, if we make a grant offer with total eligible spend of £40,000, now that can be um, capital and revenue or revenue alone. See, my brackets are completely wrong there. Um, and I will correct that before we publish the slides. Um, the maximum grant that we could offer would be £10,000. That's 25% of the total eligible spend. So you get to the end of the program and you've spent your up to 20,000 pounds on capital and your corresponding 20,000 pounds on revenue. You put a claim in, we'll repay you the 10,000 pounds, 25% of your 40,000. However, we all know that in the real world, life doesn't work out quite as neatly um, as we would like it to. So I've mapped out a couple of um, fairly common scenarios underneath. In scenario one, the project underspends, so you have a total eligible spend of £30,000. The maximum grant that we can pay would be 7500 which is the 25% of £30,000. Whereas in scenario two, um, you've overspent. OK, so your total eligible spend, at least notionally, would be £50,000. However, under the grant offer letter, the maximum grant we can pay is 10000 because that's the maximum grant we have offered. So it will always be either 25% of any value up to your total agreed project spend or the maximum grant as a cash value of any um, total spend that exceeds the amount you you applied for. In terms of including capital elements, which is the next slide. Thank you. Um, of the same total spend of £40,000, you could have all of it as revenue, absolutely fine. You could have £20,000 of it revenue and up to £20,000 of it capital, absolutely fine. However, in the two scenarios that we've just been through, where your eligible spend, where you've underspent, and your eligible spend is down to £30,000, because the maximum capital is set at 50%, that means the maximum capital spend could be £15,000. Uh, scenario two, similarly, if you overspend, um, the maximum grant we're going to pay is, is unchanged. £40,000, I've given a couple of examples of ineligible budgets here. If you apply for 100% capital, so your whole £40,000 is capital, it's not something we can approve at the moment. Similarly, if you apply for more than 50% of the grant as capital, so 19,999 pounds of revenue 
£20,001 of capital. It's not something we can approve because it's more than 50% capital. Um, if any of these percentages change, those changes will be updated on the website and in the guidance notes, and we will give advance notice of them as soon as we know what, they, what they'll be. At the moment, this is what we're working to. Next slide. Um, so this is virtually the end of my slide deck here. Um, the program specific slides, as you can imagine, are much more short and focused because there's only a couple of things we really need to cover. Again, you can watch this presentation again, you can watch the generic overview, everything, including the slides with my corrected brackets on that earlier slide, will be on the OXLEP website along with the FAQs and questions can be emailed to the business at oxfordshirelep.com email address. And now we move to um, questions on the Go Create grant scheme. I would say, can you, if you're going to ask any questions, please keep them generic because um, all the participants will be able to see the questions that you ask. So please don't put anything confidential in there. And Peter, and I think so, will be joining those. Thanks, James. Um, I've got one question that's come through, um, and it's asking about, as I'm starting a life coaching, do I need to buy the resources first and get the money back? So, talking about retrospective claiming. Yep. So, um, I'm, I'll, I'll, answer, I'll answer the same question twice because I'm not quite sure which one is being asked. If you mean um, before I put my grant claim in, do I need to have made the purchases and spent the money? The answer is yes, um, because we pay in arrears. So you, you spend and then we reimburse you. Um, if you're saying, do I need to have spent the money in order to put the grant application in? Absolutely not. Don't defray grant expenditure until after you've submitted and been approved for a grant. That's clear. Thank you, James. I haven't got any other questions at the moment in the in the chat bar. So um, we'll keep the panel open for a few more minutes if there's any other questions you'd like to ask at this point. And as James said, um, you can also get in touch with the team on the email address, the business at Oxford Chalep, um, and also check the links on the website and um, come back to us with any questions you might have. Uh, there's Sorry, one more question there, just on um, whether we can apply for both grants and um, would creating, and we'll start with that one first, can we apply for both grants? Um, if by that you mean both a Go Create grant and an Escalate grant, then yes, absolutely. They are two separate programs, um, so any one business can participate in uh, in both of them. Clearly, they have to be for different activities, um, and that's because the programs have a different focus, so there shouldn't really be an overlap. Um, what you cannot do is use the grant from um, Escalate, for example, and try and use it as match against the grant from ISFB. I'm not allowed to do that. Thank you, James. Um, we've got another question um, regarding new services. So, would creating a, a new service like an online course count as innovation? Who do you want to answer that? that, James? Yeah. 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 Well, in principle, yes, it could, I think, is what I'd say. But clearly this, as James has pointed out, this is somewhat of a competitive scheme. So you'd have to show, you know, whether the online offering that you're proposing to develop is somewhat different and innovative, uh, novel, compared to what's already out there. If it's a bit of a me too service, then I don't think it's that attractive to the uh, to the panel. If you can show that it's addressing a market 
which is somehow different, or you are doing something in a different way with that online offering, then uh, absolutely it may well qualify. And we have supported people that are moving their products and services from being face-to-face -to, -face to digital and online. As you can imagine, over the last year, that's a bit of a, been a bit of a theme as well. So possibly yes. And what I would say to you and to everybody is before you go to the trouble of, of filling out an application form, feel free to get in contact. Drop us an email which says, this is what I'm thinking of doing. This is the, the project as I see it. And we can give you some feedback on the basic idea about whether it fits and what you'd have to do to make it fit if appropriate. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, there's one more question just um, on their business is a free service life online coaching. Um, do, do I qualify? I think we probably need a bit more information there. But Peter, do you want to? I think that it's very similar to the previous point is, you know, there's a lot of online coaching offerings at the moment. And I, funnily enough, I was looking at a few this morning myself before the webinar started, just to see how people were presenting coaching offers. And um, I have to say that it's becoming a bit of a me too sort of a thing. So I think my previous answer applies. It could do, it could do, but, Yes, you are bringing something new, which is new to you, but whether it's attractive to the panel and it makes a, a difference to the economy in Oxfordshire, you know, whether the project will score well in that regard uh, is sounds a little bit questionable. If if you want to um, if you want to think through that and and see how it might be innovative, and then indeed you want to go to market with a bit of a test to see whether or not that um, service is indeed um, viable and different, then you know we may be able to support that sort of concept stage and the prototyping sort of stage of that in the same way that we would a product. But you still have to convince us and the panel that it was not just another offer. Thanks, Peter. My um, piece. But this, I was just going to say that abs absolutely agree with people. This might be an instance where um, the idea is a better fit with the Escalate program than it is with ISFB. So do look at the criteria for both and work out where you are a best fit. Because although, yes, absolutely, you can apply for both of them, um, think about how likely it is that you will be successful in each one. You may be a better fit for one program than the other. Thanks, James. Um, another quick question just about quali qualifying um, if you're not in Oxfordshire. So, for example, if you're in London applying for Go Create. Yeah, do, do, do you want me to do that one, James, as well? Yeah. Yeah, in, go on. In, in theory, well, you can tell me if I get it wrong, actually. <laughs> in, in theory, Yes, you can apply. And indeed, we have supported projects with companies that are registered elsewhere. Um, the thing is, this is an Oxfordshire programme, so it has to have some relevance for Oxfordshire. Legally, you're able to apply and anybody from, you know, from, from Tyneside through to Cornwall could apply. But they'd really have to convince the panel that there was a reason why it would be uh, fundable by why it should be fundable by an Oxfordshire based organization. But people have done that because, for example, they trial, they run trials of the project, of the product in Oxfordshire. It's an addressing an Oxfordshire problem, uh, might be mobility, might be some particular healthcare challenge or whatever. You know, so if there's relevance for Oxfordshire, yes, then we can look at it. And if you're partnering somehow in the project with um, with an Oxfordshire based organisation or community, then that would be, for example, something which would um, make it more uh, applicable to Oxfordshire. And if you're targeting an Oxfordshire market, 
which is not just Oxfordshire because it has to be an OX postcode, then you know, then that's something else which would make it relevant to the scheme. Great, thanks very much, Peter. Um, there was another was that question. Right, just... <laughs> oh, oh. Yep, absolutely. Uh, there was just another question on um, details for staff on each project um, to review applications, but I would just say the best thing to do is um, either give us a call or or contact or contact us on the business at email address um, and just express which um, which grant project you're interested in, and we can direct you to the right team and they can get back to you. Um, we just had a few thanks for answering on those questions, so thank you both. Um, I think that's it for the current questions. Was there anything you wanted to add, Peter? Yeah, I'd like to comment, if I may. I, I think we've got time. So I, I'd like to comment on what people might have um, been hearing about the procurement rules and the, the guidelines that we have to follow. We don't have any choice over these. Now, when you're pursuing an innovation project, you are probably talking to all sorts of potential partners, suppliers, collaborators, um, developers, and you'll have to have quite a lot of conversations before you can even get as far as a decent quote. Now, we do recognise that, but we are constrained in the way that we are able to deliver the programme. So what I'd say is, is if you could think about the possibility of a grant supporting those costs as early as possible in those conversations and keep those conversations as open as possible so that you do involve um, other suppliers. Because if you do get so far down the line with one particular supplier or developer and make it really hard for you to go back and get other quotes from other people it's just going to be tricky for us to get that through the scheme not impossible but tricky so just bear in mind that we work under those constraints as well but we also recognize that innovation isn't a linear process and you don't just sort of start asking for quotes on day one so and so day one of having a, you know made an application so yeah we kind of try and help you with that but bear in mind that it's worth keeping those uh, lines of communication open with other suppliers if you can thank you peter uh, there's just one more question um do we need quotes for both applications so yes the answer is yes for that. Um, James will be doing um, another session on Escalate shortly, um, but the same um, rules apply on both in terms of quotes. Thanks, Peter. There's one other quickie, uh, Sophie, that because of because of these constraints, one thing I generally say to people, and, and I think James made it made the point as well in the general presentation is it would it probably pays you to keep your application relatively simple but both in terms of the explanations you give us but also in terms of things like the number of suppliers because the more suppliers you have the more quotes you have the more evidence you have to supply the more an auditor is likely to come back and say well i like 15 out of those items but not number 16 and and you know it really does get down to that so if you can i would work towards simplifying your application it may mean that you have to reduce your total claim or your total grant a little bit but to some extent it's a balance of how much effort do you want to put into admin how much effort do you you, you know are you able to sort of risk and reward thing so keeping projects relatively simple in terms of the number of suppliers and things involved is going to pay off for you longer term I think as well. Thanks very much Peter. Um, we've had no more questions on the on the um, chat bar so um, was there anything else James or Peter you wanted to add at this point? Not from me I don't think. Not really just good luck to those who decide to apply. 
Absolutely. And um, just to reiterate, yeah, just get in touch with us on that business email address and um, we'll, um, if it's for ISFB, we'll get back to you, me and the team will get back to you. Um, and if not, we'll signpost you to the uh, relevant team if it's for a different programme that you're interested in. Um, but thank you for your attendance today on the ISFB session. Um, I think we're moving straight into the Escalate session that starts at 11.45. So um, oh, if you'd like to stay on for that, um, there's a few minutes in between, James. Okay. But thank you for joining for the ISFB session and um, we look forward to hearing from you soon. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, you, Thanks James. Okay, welcome back. Um, we're running to the agenda that was published rather than the agenda that I rather mistakenly announced, having not read my emails properly. Um, moving on to the Escalate Grants presentation and uh, Sarah, I think, is going to facilitate this for us. Thanks, James. Yes, I'm Sarah Beale. I'm the Escalate uh, Programme Manager. Um, so basically the same format as the ISFB one we've just had, if anyone stayed for that as well. Um, James will run through some slides and then um, we'll have questions. Also joining us, we've got Andrea, who I can't see at the moment, but um, I'm not sure if you can hear us, Andrea, and you want to introduce yourself? I can. Hello, everyone. I'm just trying to get my webcam to work. Um, thanks for joining us today. And yes, I'll help um, Sarah with any questions after after the presentation. OK, James, over to you. Thank you very much, Sarah. So uh, this presentation follows um, for those who've just sat through the um, Go Create one, exactly the same format, uh, an overview of Escalate the grant support that's available, uh, eligible activities and how the grants work. Um, and what I hope everyone has now memorised is the Q&A email address business at oxfordshirelep.com. So the Escalate programme has three elements. Uh, there's support for um, social enterprises, businesses with a social purpose. Uh, there is specific support for scale up businesses around access to finance and investment readiness um, with some limited support for uh, more normal startup and growth businesses. And there's the Escalate grant element, which is the focus of this presentation. In terms of the budget available on this, um, we have around about 135,000 pounds of grant money uncommitted. Uh, this money is matched at 50%. So for every pound we pay you, um, you'll need to find one pound of match to put against it. Um, so 135,000 of grant money will be matched against 135,000 of um, grant applicant money. The minimum amount of grant that we can pay out uh, for an application is a thousand pounds. The reason for this is that a thousand pounds is the threshold for us to um, to report a grant paid. So we cannot report a grant that we've paid that is less than a thousand pounds. Therefore, that's the minimum grant value. The maximum grant uh, we can pay out available under Escalate is twenty five thousand pounds meaning that at a 50% grant rate, the maximum total costs for any grant project is going to be £50,000. Um, so clearly we'd like to award grants to as many Oxfordshire SMEs as possible, and we're simply going to keep holding further grant rounds until all of the available budget is committed. Um, so that could be, assuming everyone applies for about £25,000, that could just be um, six more applications, or it could be 134. Um, I imagine it will be somewhere in between. In terms of, next slide please. Thank you, the eligibility. Um, for Escalate, I've talked about startup and growth businesses, so that's, that's pretty much any business um, that's out there. We have a specific focus on scale up businesses, um, which are those that are looking to achieve 20% growth in each year. And that can be growth by number of employees, growth by turnover, or both employee and turnover growth. Um, 
one of the vagaries of the government's definition of this is that if you haven't got that growth of 20% a year that you can demonstrate, if you have the growth potential, then you'll also qualify as a scale up business. Um, so really we're looking at businesses that have um, significant growth objectives or are achieving significant growth. The other part of the program, which is the next slide, looks at uh, enterprises for social good. Um, so this includes enterprising charities, social enterprises, social entrepreneurs, and purposeful businesses. Um, that is a deliberately wide ranging definition, but effectively it's an organization that can say that one of the following three bullet points is, is true about itself. They've been established to enable, to facilitate, to deliver a positive social and or environmental change. You're committed to reinvesting the majority principal proportion of profits and income towards achieving some social environmental objectives and that those objectives are uh, positive or you're a purpose driven company. Um, so that could be um, a certified B Corp or something similar. Um, so that is a, a wide range of um, potential eligibility coming under the, the social side of the program. Next slide. In terms of the eligible activities, the things that an Escalate grant can support um, for scale ups, when we're looking specifically at the access to finance and investment readiness element, it's all around consultancy activity. So it's helping you to prepare for accessing finance or helping you to do things that make your business more attractive um, and more ready to receive and gain and obtain investment. Um, critical thing to say here is that because we are not allowed to favor one funder above another, um, there are some limits on the sort of support we can give. So we can give generic support, but we can't give specific support. So what I mean by that is that um, we could support consultancy work that helps you prepare for accessing finance from venture capital trusts. What we couldn't do is help you prepare for a meeting with a specific venture capital trust um, where you're looking to raise money because that is a specific funder, whereas we're only allowed to help with generic funding streams. If in doubt, you'll all be able to guess what I'm about to say now, please contact the team and ask them. In terms of the eligible activities for other businesses, uh, this is a lot wider. So this can cover uh, redesigning business model, new product and service development, um, plans for diversification or for exports, or any other barriers to growth that you have. Um, and that can range from um, marketing uh, to small items of equipment. The objectives of all of this are to increase sales, to improve your productivity and your profitability, improve your business processes, and at the end of the day, to create additional jobs, which are one of the things that we'll report against. Um, thank you. So how does it, how does it work? Um, in comparison to the Go Create grants, the Escalate grants are very simple, being a 50% grant rate. So the eligible spend of 10,000, we offer a grant of five, which is half of the spend. If you underspend, the maximum grant we can pay is half of whatever you've spent. So if your total spend is only 8,000, the maximum grant uh, is then 4,000. Um, if your eligible spend is higher, so you end up spending £12,000, the maximum grant we can pay is the cash value that we've offered, so the £5,000. So it is a lot simpler than the um, Go Create program. Um, 
as it stands, the Escalate program is um, only revenue. Therefore, any capital items uh, should be capped at the £4,999 limit that I talk about um, in the other presentations. Um, so if you do buy a laptop for 1500 it will be a mobile asset, um, still a revenue cost, and there will be the requirement to enter that on an asset register with all of the uh, reference numbers, photographs, etc., cetera, um, that I talked about in the earlier presentation. On to the next slide. Really, that's the, um, the end of my real content filled slides. Again, you'll have seen this uh, slide before. You can watch this presentation again and the generic one. The slides and the guidance notes are on the Oxlap website. There's Andrea. I'm glad to see she's got her webcam working. Um, and there's question and answers that are published on the website. And again, the email address that is the answer to all problems, business at oxfordshirelep.com. So questions. Thank you, James, for that. Um, well, currently you've just stunned everybody into silence. We don't actually have any questions at the moment in the um, in the question panel we'll give people uh perhaps oh there we go some just come through there we go so um let's see uh so someone's asking we want to source branding architecture website development and creation of packaging etc do we have to go with the lowest quote or the best fit um there is no requirement to choose the lowest quote you should choose the best overall supplier so if somebody is very cheap because it's made of tissue paper for the packaging, uh, you probably wouldn't choose them. You'd go with a, a proper cardboard box manufacturer. So choose the best fit. It doesn't have to be the cheapest, um, but you do need to provide an explanation for why you've chosen that specific supplier. So there you can tell us why the why they are better than the, the cheapest one. Yeah, thanks, James. And just to follow on to that is, um, do we therefore create our own rubric rubric for selection? Um, yes. So if you're if you're at the three quote stage, use your own selection criteria and just explain that to us in the application form. If you happen to be doing something that is valued at the open threshold, so over twenty five thousand, you would need to set that rubric that criteria out in the specification and then you just follow it when the tenders are received the bids are received so yes you do have that flexibility the critical thing with this is not that we or the auditors want to enforce a specific selection mechanism or scoring process on you it's that you have one and that you follow it thanks james um so uh, we've got another question now come through, which um, uh, a holistic therapist moving a business online and um, would the Escalate program cover a course to take, which doesn't result in a qualification, but would teach me how to move my business online? Theoretically, yes, he says. I mean, it, it depends. It depends on the nature of the course, the importance of it to the business. And it goes back to, for anyone who was here for the Go Create one, um, how effectively you can sell that um, project activity to the grants panel. Thanks, James. Um, OK, uh, the, um, uh, we've got a question here about where we can find the application form. Uh, what we tend to do is not make the application form available on the website just because we like to speak to people before they apply. Um, typically what we've done in the past, correct me if I'm wrong, but when we used to run these face to face, we'd make the applications available to everyone who'd attended the session. So as part of the follow up to this, um, we'll be in touch with people who have uh, attended to make sure that they can get a copy of the application form and also to see if they've got any more questions which we can answer or address in an open forum. Um, another question about application form, how many application form funding can I do per year? Um, I'm quite happy to answer that one. As, as we said, I think already in the presentations, um, you can apply to both programmes for a grant, but once you've had a grant, you 
that's the only one you can have through each program but if you are rejected at panel um, you can apply again so you can continue to attempt applying if you wish um, but we would suggest you know a, a close look at the feedback that you get and some more conversations with the team um, rather than just keep applying and applying if you're if you're getting knocked back each time uh, okay um, just make sure okay can impact deliverables be aspirational or concrete plans I don't know if Andrew or James want to answer that one uh, that's probably because I was grinning um, yes I, I can answer that one um, they should not be aspirational in the sense of um, if you look at the impact deliverables and say, I really hope I can create 10 jobs, don't put 10 jobs in. Um, if you look at the impact deliverables and say, um, we can definitely create um, two jobs, so I'm going to put two jobs in, fine. Um, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that don't make promises that you don't believe you can keep, is what I'm saying. So. I think James, no. if, if, if yep. I could add to that, so so when I'm talking to clients, I'll talk about obviously they submit their business plan alongside their application when they apply for an Escalate grant. So I think when I'm talking to clients, I'm asking them to be kind of firm in terms of those impact deliverables, but obviously they can share with the panel the, the company's future growth trajectory and their aspirations in the business plan. But in terms of the application, they have to be relatively firm and, and they're able to commit to those. Uh, exactly right exactly right we will we are i'll say we will never um we are very unlikely to um nail anyone to the mast if they're unable to achieve an impact deliverable because we understand that things change you might do your project and discover that actually this isn't a good idea therefore we're not going to go ahead with it because it won't make much impact on our business um but at the same time, they are firm commitments, as Andrea says, and part of the assessment process, part of the scoring is how realistic do we as assessors think these are. So if there are aspirations that don't fit in with the rest of your business planning or that don't match up to the activity and the growth that you say will come from your project, you're likely to score poorly on that section. Um, because we can't see how the, the 10 jobs will come from something that looks like it will only create one. Thank you both. Um, a question about match funding. Um, can we use grants received from other funding, funding bodies such as the Arts Council or government COVID grants as match funding? Uh, perhaps one for you, James. Yeah. Um, yes, you can, but this is, this is one of my wonderful compliance questions that's yes but um, the match funding used erdf grants has to be clean match funding so what what they mean by clean is that it has not been matched against any other european funding elsewhere so if you're given um, a covid grant from a local authority and that's money that has just come from bays you're given the whole I don't know, two and a half thousand, whatever it may be, and it's Bayes money, it has not been matched anywhere else. It's fine to use it as match against um, one of these grants. If at any point that money has been matched against European money elsewhere, then it can't be used as match against the RDF. Um, the preference certainly for Escalate is that the money is what we call private match so it, it belongs to the to the applicant businesses um, but public match is is allowable for escalate but please make sure you tell us the source of the match in your application if it's if it's coming from anywhere other than within the business investment in the business and we do ask for that thanks james um, okay, uh, a longer one here. So um, uh, we're currently three months into a six month UKRI sustainable innovation grant. The findings have moved our business model on to be more viable. We don't yet have a full business plan as the techno 
economics are part of our Q2 WPs. We need grant funding to help us with our exploita exploitation, perhaps exploration, and so far we're on scope for Go Create and Escalate. Will the fact we do not yet have a full business plan in place be important? <laughs> Not sure which of you wants to go for that one. Um, I I would imagine that a full business plan is required, is it not, James? Would you say? Uh, we require a business plan. We do not specify the format of that business plan. Um, and because of the range of applicants we get, a business plan for somebody who formed their business two weeks ago is likely to be shorter and simpler than that of a business that's been established for seven years. Um, I would say that the answer to that question is that we require a business plan and that the business plan needs to provide enough assurance that the grant project is a, a relevant and important part of the business's development. That's probably about as far as I'll go from a compliance point of view. It then it then becomes a, a judgment question. Um, and hopefully we can advise on the, the content and the sort of areas that you'd need to highlight as being as still needing further work. Yeah, I think that's that's a perfect example of where, you know, the support that runs alongside the, um, you know, the ability to apply for the grant. So once you've signed up to Escalate, you have access to obviously the grant to apply for that. But you've also got access to 12 hours of fully funded support. So that could be time spent with myself. I only manage the scale up side of things. I have a colleague that manages the social enterprise side. Um, but that would be a perfect use of, of time with myself to go through that business plan and identify, you know, areas that, that do require more detail um, before you submit your grant application. Thanks, Andrea. That's pretty much exactly what I was going <laughs> to say. Then. So, um, so still on business plans. Um, some saying is it essential to provide a business plan if it is we don't currently have one does it need to be for the whole organization or for the escalate project only um, and then there's a kind of follow-up to that one from the same same business if we don't have a business plan can we apply for funding for consultancy to produce a business plan <laughs> james the compliance yeah. answer first and then we can the, the compliance the compliance answer sort of harks back to the answer given before uh, support support to develop a business plan is an eligible cost. If you wanted a grant for somebody to write you a business plan, you could go for that. Um, I would prefer, and I think it would be a stronger application if some of the business planning work was done alongside Andrea, for example, on the scale upside, um, rather than just outsourcing it. I think you would find it difficult to meet the requirement to provide us with a business plan if you're project is just to develop a business plan that you haven't got um, and I think the scorers would find it difficult to assess the um, potential impact on the business because there's nothing to, to map against there's no plan to map back against so I would say do at least um, some initial business planning work uh, with Andrea or with the, the social enterprise support um, and put something in that you can describe as an outline business plan. I think, James, the way I often see it, and forgive me if I'm, I'm wrong, but it's kind of the, the, the business plan will give the panel assurances that the company is sustainable and the application gives the panel the confidence that the project is viable and will deliver what they say it will against the business plan so the two kind of work hand in hand and james is exactly right we see very good um, business plans come through that may be you know 12 slides of, of powerpoint made into a pdf but they incorporate the the core requirements of a business plan and what the panel need to see and then we might have a business plan that comes through that's 50 or 60 pages of war and peace and and that's because they've they've maybe got more to put into it so there's core components and certainly through a session or two with myself we can work that through so that at least you can give um the panel that assurance that you know um you require or it, or it justifies those public funds to create a more in-depth business plan later on if that indeed is required you might find that you know 
through working with myself we can we can get there and you could perhaps apply for the funding for something else thanks both yeah i think andrew that's a really good point that we would like you know we'd like people to make use of the support that's available there and there may be things that you want to put into a grant application which you can actually address through the free uh, through the funded support we've got um, and you know then you find that there's other things you can focus the grant application on uh, okay one question here just to clarify for the escalate we do not need to be defined as a scale up is that correct um, yes yeah i answered that one quite quickly um yes we've got the three strands to the escalate program so there's the scale up route the route for enterprises for social good and the route for generic startup and growth businesses uh, basically everybody else um, just make sure that when you're putting your application in that you identify correctly because there's different scoring criteria for each so if you put scale up you'll be scored as a scale up and if you haven't answered the scale up specifics in that it will obviously be detrimental to your application so make sure you're just looking at the guidance alongside the application form because the guidance specifies the scoring criteria so can i just clarify that because sometimes we get a lot of confusion around what a scale-up is because when any company is growing they think they're scaling up but there are firm criteria around what qualifies as a scale-up enterprise so a lot of the grant applications that we come through would probably fit into the the growth sme category because a scale-up um, you know, some of the criteria might be they've already had, if they're going down the investment route, they might have already had seed funding and they're going on to Series A. Or if they've grown through bootstrapping, for example, they might have revenues, you know, of 500k and above. So, and they're not, you know, set in stone, but it gives you an idea of what a scale up is. It's kind of like that next level. So a lot of the applications probably fall into the growth SME um or you know obviously we're supporting a, a, a certain number of startups at the moment as well but just to clarify because i know there's a lot of confusion around that yeah that's that's a really good point andrea and um, i think like you say most may fit into the growth uh, growth sme category because the um the scale up um it's not just about how the business defines itself but what the grants meant to be used for because on the scale up side it's meant to be specifically for consultancy for accessing finance or becoming investment ready so the question you'll be asked to answer if you're applying as a scale up is to what extent will the grant project enable the applicant to become investment ready or to access finance so if that isn't the core component of your your response you're, you're better off as a growth sme uh, okay, um, we haven't got any more questions at the moment. Um, I did allow more time for this session than the uh, ISFB Go Create grant session because obviously we've got the three different strands to this, so there was potentially um, more interest and more uh, uh, questions here. Okay, just one's just come through there. Um, would you be able to clarify what counts as a new product or process or service under impact deliverables? For example, if our project was to create an integrated website database booking system, would this new booking system count as a new service and impact deliverables? James, do you want to answer that from a, how we yep. how ELDF would view it? Um, I mean, the, the simple answer is yes, if you're willing to certify that it's new, because the impact deliverables form is effectively a self-certification, although there is evidence that supports it. So you would be certifying to say that we didn't have this product internally, and we now do, and therefore you have a new product or service within the business. Or you would say, well, it's a new product into the market, depending on which of the two deliverables you're you're looking at. Um, and then for the market one, the supporting evidence would be, you know, your marketing collateral, so a screenshot from your website showing that you're selling. The product or service um, and then for the new product the firm it'll be sort of an internal version of that so there'll be something that explains to the rest of the business that you now have this product available for use and here's how they use it which wasn't previously available so at the end of the day it's a self-certification as part of the scoring and assessment process will make a judgment on how far it's it's new and, and novel and different um, and there is a requirement for evidence to to assure an auditor that the self-certification is accurate um, it's you know it's not just a case of saying yes it's it's definitely new um, there's some evidence needed to to show that it there is some novelty 
Thanks, James. Um, just a question here about what, uh, what's eligible. So costs related to marketing a product, can these be covered by the grants? And yeah, that's, uh, that's something I think we've, um, we've covered off and there's a bit more detail as well um, within the grant guidance documents about what's eligible and what's not. Um, if you feel like it's not covered, as we keep saying, just contact the team, contact the business email address and we can uh, give you a bit more guidance on that. Um, at the moment, no more questions. We have got, um, well, we've got another half an hour for this session, but obviously we're not going to string it out if, uh, if it's not needed. Um, we were going to bring everyone back at quarter to one just to see if there's any final questions to wrap up. Um, but suggest we just give a couple of minutes and if there's nothing further, uh, then perhaps we could uh, just bring the session to a close. I think um, it might be the most sensible approach. At this point, Andrea or James, was there anything you wanted to add around the Escalate grants at all? Um, no, not really, not, not about the grants, um, other than, you know, it's, it's more really about support to try and see the programme as more than just a, a grant programme. You know, there's, there's those 12 hours and they can be used. Obviously, it's time with myself or, or time with my colleague on the social enterprise side. Um, we also have a number of topical webinars that are being really well attended at the moment. Um, they're more like group meetings. And we've got um, peer to peer starting very soon as well. So those hours can be used up in a variety of different ways. So you're not only really getting specialist support, um, but you're also able to reach out to your peers as well. Um, so I would urge you to, to look beyond just the grant funding and think about what the support can offer as well. Thanks, Andrea. Um, just a couple of, of questions just come in there while we were just talking. Um, so yes, um, the Escalate presentation was the one we started at quarter two and we've just allowed a, an hour for this because we were expecting potentially more uh, attendees. Um, so we are discussing Escalate at the moment. Um, we've had a couple of questions um, which go back to ISFB, um, which uh, which we might just hung on to for a second. Um, I think uh, someone's just asking, what's the difference between both grants? Um, hopefully by listening to the presentations, it's clear clear what the differences are. Perhaps it's worth um, a separate conversation with the team. If, um, if, you were, if you sat through this and you're still unsure which one would be the most appropriate for you to apply for, it might be better just dropping the business at oxfordshirelep.com email address a message. Uh, and then one of us can um, can speak to you separately. Uh, questions? Sorry, just trying to keep up with these. A few popped in now. Um, can we get the presentation via email? Yes, we'll be following up with everybody after this via email. Um, the presentation and the um, the slides will both go onto our website. I think the video will be on YouTube, and you'll be able to access a link uh, which we'll share. Um, okay. I think we just move on to the couple of ISFB questions which have come in and then we can probably wrap up. Um, someone's asked for the Go Create, does it need to be a new business? No, you can be an existing business. Thanks, James. Um, and just uh, for all of them, the business has to already be in existence. We can't issue the grants to pre-start. So the business needs to either be registered with Companies House or as a sole trader. Yep, that's right. And then last, oh, hang on, sorry. Do we need to have bought first all the equipment first and get the funding later? I think if we covered yeah. that one already. I think, I think we have. We, we, we reimburse your expenditure is how it works. So once, once we've awarded the grant, you can then go out and spend. Uh, once you've spent, you can then reclaim the grant element from us. Thanks, James. OK, and then someone's asked to explain a little about the innovation facilities um, while there are a couple of minutes. Um, I don't know if that's something that perhaps uh, Peter, if he's still around, could um, address or uh, perhaps it's worth a separate conversation with the ISFB team. Ah, there he is. No, I, can, uh, I can give people an overview. So in the early stages of the ISFB programme, we supported the development of a number of locations. So these are physical places where 
um, innovation is supported, um, you might be able to locate there or you may be able to access some facilities. The most obvious ones are Big Brook Science Park, where we help set up something called an Agile Lab. Um, some of our clients are currently part of the time located there. So that's a place where you can do uh, prototyping, etc. You have to fit with what the lab can help with, um, but the team at Bedbrook uh, can can help work that out. We also supported the um, opening of the Innovation Centre, Eco Business Centre, I think it's called at Vista, which is a shared office facility, but has a, a obviously a focus on eco um, and eco construction, mobility, etc. There's still space there, I think. I think more broadly speaking, though, the programs moved on. So we're not just able to signpost people towards the ones we helped set up. There's lots of other innovation facilities and locations in Oxfordshire. And we've just updated a couple of lists which people can apply to us to get, which are innovation centres, um, science parks, um facility shared workspaces with some common facilities for lab or wet labs etc etc so yeah there's the ones we supported there's the ones that's available to everybody i think now that the program's a bit more mature it's that bigger list which will be of interest to people so get in contact and we can send that on thanks peter yeah just um a few thank yous there thank you that's really useful um yeah, I think um, probably a good point to wrap up then if there's no more questions. Um, slightly, uh, well, quite a bit ahead of schedule there. Um, but um, the recording will all be on YouTube. There's the guidance and the uh, Q&A on the website. And if people have specific questions which they didn't want to raise here or, or didn't get the chance to, then please drop the team an email at businessoxfordshirelep.com and we'll get back to you. And um, if you want to make appointments with either Peter or Andrea to have conversations with them about your specific project and your business, then again, please get in touch via the business uh, email address and we can refer them on. Um, sorry about that, that's my children just joining in a little bit at the end there. Um, has anyone got uh, anything else to say before we finish up? Okay, lovely. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today um, and please do get in touch um, if there's anything more we can help you with. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.